appreciate you bearing with me with that kind of technical issue. Uh, just before we start, kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was um, the, the knowledge and the tips and tricks that I picked up now would have been super useful to me as I was starting. And if I can give somebody just a bit of a leg up or a bit, you know, get up to speed a bit more, then I'll, I've done my job here. Um, so yeah, a bit more about me. Uh, I'm a boy, uh, graduated from university uh, officer doing game development. Uh, I'm now a software engineer at PwC. And um, one of my needs and challenges is in fact public speaking. And that's another reason why I'm here. It's better to be sort of, well, the first sort of thing I learned, it's better to be a B plus in all columns than it is to be an X dot in one, like an E in another. So it's good to have all those strings to your bow for off the bat. Um, another need that I have is I need more sleep. And I will get to that, but there is a part of the, the white sleep as much as my director will not agree with that. <laughs> but um, the goal of today is to sort of make sort of the world of development a bit less scary for people if it is just a bit challenging. So first I'm gonna take you back sort of to my second year of university. Um, me and three other guys decided that we were gonna try our hand at starting out uh, our own indie game development company. Um, we were a team of three, a uh, team of three developers, so all we wanted to do was just make games, make games, make games. But uh, the university decided that to let us do this for our basement year, which we were going to take a year out instead of doing work experience, we were going to do uh, this sort of start up by ourselves, that we had to uh, complete this course called the Office of Business Launchpad. And that sort of taught you how to start a business in the traditional sense, so making a business plan, uh, sorting out your overheads, making sure the lights stay on, that kind of paper. But um, <coughs> we, we went through that and we actually got funded at the end of it. We managed to get £2,500 from Santander as a grant. And that was really useful for us. Uh, we got licenses from that. We got uh, enough money to get new gear, like new equipment, new computers. And by some divine miracle, we got free office space in uh, University of Oslo Jordan's time, which just doesn't happen. So we had overheads and things were going well we were getting external contracts sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry with all the confusion no, it's, it's I, I okay. overlooked this important detail cheers so we um, yeah things were going well and we were starting to get uh, external contracts from other game development companies that were around and we took a job on for a couple of months and that's when I really started to notice uh, the deficiencies that we had in, in our startup. Um, we were three developers and that was it. We didn't have product managers, we didn't have marketing people, we didn't have anything like that. And I know there's some companies around Belfast can do it that way, but it, we really didn't. And the point I want to make is we had everything going for us there and then it just sort of petered out. And the reason it did was because we had no accountability whatsoever. There was nobody there to tell us, okay, we should start doing this bit now, or oh, if you're taking care of that one feature, I'll work on this. We just kind of smashed each other, like trying to do different things and committing over other people's commits and all stuff like that. It was, it was chaos. And we also avoided responsibility. And that was quite a big one. We, we knew we had followers and stuff on social media and all that, and we had a responsibility to let them know what was going on. You know, they've taken the time out to follow us and take an interest in us, it's, we should have give stuff back and we really didn't an awful lot. And we had a responsibility to the game that we were developing as well to get it out there and at least let people play it and see what was going on. And it ended up that we didn't. But that was third year um, and we actually still had a year to do and I managed to get through it quite well. I got as good as I could get, I got a first which I was super happy with and I kind of felt like then that's the hard work over. You know, I've got a, a piece of paper now that costs about 20 grand and it's all nice and it's got nice writing on it that sort of says, yep, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to work. And I kind of felt justified with that, that I was ready to work. But I would soon, I would soon realize that it's a lot different whenever you get into the world of work. So at fourth year, I was helping, uh, you know, it with labs, um, teaching sort of second and first year students and helping them out there. But whenever I come into work, I was right back at the bottom of the pecking order again. I had to start all over. And that, that can be quite scary whenever you realize that at the start. So this is where the kind of the guide starts. And the first step's pretty easy. It's find yourself a rookie. And that's you. And it doesn't matter if you've been just left university 
in your first year of work or if you've been working at something for maybe five years. Um, you can be a rookie at any stage in your career. And for the likes of the more experienced people, if you take on a new role or you're doing a new task that you've never done before, you kind of feel yourself drop back into the rookie role again. And, uh, sorry, um, yeah, so uh, like I said, after university, I kind of dropped right back into that rookie role. And a good book to read it, that, like, around this is Rookie Smarts by Liz Wiseman. It's a very good book, and I'd suggest you having a go at that. Step two is just uh, Rookie Smarts by Liz Wiseman. So step two is just ask the silly questions. And now there's the cliche of, oh, there is no such thing as the silly questions, but kind of sometimes there are, but it's okay to ask them. Reason being, it's much better to be to be uh, annoying just a little bit and get stuff right than it is to be stuck for ages and then do something wrong. Because you've just wasted a whole amount of time being stuck and bashing your head off a wall. And then you're gonna have to spend an extra bit of time fixing your mistakes. So it's better just to be a little bit annoying. You know, you've maybe asked somebody something two or three times, give them the fourth one. As long as you get what you need from it and you, you get that bit of right information to do what you need to, it's worth it. And if all else fails, I'll give you the permission to ask those silly questions and whoever you ask them to, if they get mad, they can shout at me on Twitter or something. Step three, this would be much better if you could see the GIF, it's Star Wars, but anyway. So the, ste the third step is find your Jedi Masters. And I'm kind of lying a bit because there's no such thing as Jedi, unfortunately. But what I mean by that is find a mentor, find somebody that's gonna you know, show you the way, show you where's, where's good to look, what, what meetups are good, who to talk to and different technologies that you might be interested in. And I kind of want to make a distinction here between coaches, uh, role models and uh, mentors. So a coach is someone that you'll talk to on a daily basis and it's kind of around task oriented things. Um, a role model is like that, but maybe a step back, they kind of have an idea of where you want to go in your career and kind of what paths you should look at. And a role model is someone that you might not necessarily have uh, interactions with all the time but it's somebody you aspire to be and it's okay to start copying them like I have a few ro role models in work and you know I'll try and emulate the things that they do because as you start emulating people you start putting your own spin on things and you start adding your own originality and the, the way you do stuff that's fine um, a good point to make is it can be anyone it doesn't necessarily have to be people that's in your team or in your company um, a really good place to meet them is places like this, like start, like these conferences and the different meetups that are around the place. And it's good to have more than one mentor. So you can have mentors for different sort of areas that you're interested in. So if you're really interested in artificial intelligence, you can find somebody that's good at that and has the time for you. And you, you know, learn that AI skills from them. And if there's somebody around blockchain, you can find a blockchain mentor. So you can have a lot of different mentors about different things. And it's a, Around finding mentors, it's about building up a network of where you get information from. It's a bit different to university now, where in university and school you're taught X and then you're tested on X. That's how it goes. But when you start work, you know X, but you need to know X, Y, Z now. And so that's how you find that Y, Z. And that kind of comes from your network of people and how you can pull in that information and getting different mentors for different things. Uh, what to look for in a mentor, um, someone you can be embarrassed around because you will be. You're going to be asking them the silly questions over and over again. You're going to say something and as you say that question, you're like, I shouldn't have said that. But you're going to be embarrassed around them anyway, so just go for it. Uh, someone who has patience, um, you need to find somebody who's going to take the time with you and you know listen to those silly questions. Um, and also a point I'd like to make about that is uh, find someone who's not overly busy. There's some people in companies that are just flat out all the time and it's a bit unfair to you know, always break up on them, but if they have the time for you, grand. Uh, last one's a bit of a no-brainer, someone you get along with. You're gonna be spending a whole lot of time with these people, it's kind of better if you like them. <coughs> Step four is uh, beware burnout. Um, so. I've had this a couple of times at uni and a couple of times at work. Burnout is when you would literally rather do anything than what you're doing right now. So if you're sitting writing code or whatever and you think to yourself, if I type in another word, I'm gonna strangle someone, then you're burnt out. 
you're just done. Um, and speaking to people, there's a couple of different ways to kind of prevent that from happening. And one of them is to just take a break, take five minutes, go get a cup of tea, a coffee, kind of Coke, whatever. And it's good if you can get outside too, a bit of fresh air, you'll sit down at the problem and it'll be completely different. Um, and if your company allows you, maybe just take a Friday off, you know, have a long weekend, set back and recharge. Uh, another point is productivity over presence. Again, if the circumstances allow, if you can work from home and you're a bit more productive at home, always, nobody should shout at you for working at home if you're doing more work. So if you're in the office and it's just soul destroying and you're not getting anything done, try working from home for a bit. And the last point, um, which I only really started to understand in the last couple of months, is not to compare yourself to the more experienced people in your team. Um, it's a bit naive, but I, I did that at the start. I was saying to myself, oh, I can't do stuff like they can, I can't do something that they can. And I was getting myself down, I was getting myself frustrated. I was staying up late, trying to learn stuff to try and like catch up, but you can't catch up a whole technology in a night, it just doesn't work like that. So. What you should really be doing is comparing yourself to you yesterday and trying to find those wee incremental gains in your knowledge and your independence and autonomy. Because that's what you want yeah, to aim for. You want to aim for to be a bit more knowledgeable and to be able to do it by yourself a bit more gradually each day. And if you can get just a 1% gain a day for 100 days, 100%, right? Something like that, anyway. So step five is go to meetups. Um, probably the front row can kind of see the, the little meetup icon. If you don't have the meetup app on your phone, shame on you really. <laughs> There's a load of good meetups that, that are around uh, Belfast especially, and it's good to get dive straight into them. There's a load of knowledgeable people there, and they will help you. Like, if you ask them, they will help you. And it's not that you need to ask them. As good as they are, they're not telepathic. Like, they need to know that you're uh, needing some help. And going to different meetups uh, can get you involved in some interesting tech that you maybe wouldn't have tried before. And uh, another point to that is, if you have an interest in AI, but you don't really know anything about AI, just go to it. It's good too if you can go to it and challenge somebody who thinks they know AI and ask them those silly questions and see them just shock horror as they can't, <laughs> can't seem to answer any of them. It's good to challenge people like that. And you can also have uh, a massive effect on the community around you. So there's this sort of uh, theory or this effect of the thousand person effect, which I think is a bit, it's a bit too high. I kind of like to go 500 person effect where, excuse me, <coughs> if, you're at a, if you're at a meetup and you're having a conversation with someone and it's a meaningful conversation and you're telling them something that they don't know and you get information from them that you don't know, you're more likely to then use that information to influence how you talk to, say, your 250 friends and family. So from that one conversation and those 250 on one side and 250 on the other, there's 500 people. And especially in settings like this, hopefully if I'm giving you information, there's quite a lot of people that hopefully I've influenced from just this one presentation. So it's not just the people in the room, it's the people outside as well. And I think it's an unwritten rule that uh, meetups always have pizza. Um, I think that's just a rule of law, and I think you can walk out if they don't have any. So the last step is uh, go to bed. Um, so this is the sleep part. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's really good for your health. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the main reason. There's kind of this, um, uh, I, I think it's kind of a quite detrimental stereotype about sort of developers and programmers where you imagine someone just sitting in a dark room just lit by only the screen. There's coffee stains and pizza boxes everywhere. And I think that's quite, you know, that's, that's bad. That's not what you really want to be aiming for. You want to be aiming for, you know, happy, smiling, everything's nice and bright. But uh, yeah, so go to bed, get those, get those eight hours of sleep. There's a good book to read, and it's called Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I've got it on Audible at the minute, listen to that. Um, yeah, so another good point about sleep is uh, whenever you're learning something, and if anybody's ever tried learning an instrument, you'll probably resonate with this quite well. Your brain tends to chunk things up into like easy to digest things. So especially if you're learning a, a, an instrument, 
you'll get a couple of chords down, but it won't always fit quite the same or it won't always kind of sound great. And then if you go and have a good sleep the next day, you find it a little easier, a little better. And what happens is as you sleep, your brain starts to stitch all those chunks together. And that even works for when you're doing development work. So if, you, if you're learning new technology, it's not necessarily practice makes perfect. It's practice with a good night's sleep that makes perfect. Um, yeah, and kind of the last point on this slide is uh, nobody's ever told you to stay up with a problem. Nobody's ever said, oh, you have, a, you have a problem. Stay awake with that. Stay up all night and think about it. It's always sleep on it. Go and sleep on it and see how you feel in the morning. And that's because your brain doesn't go into stasis whenever you sleep. In fact, it starts to ramp up and there's parts of your brain go up to 30% faster when you're asleep and while you're awake. And what your brain's doing is it's running through all possibilities. You might not remember it doing it, but you've probably realized or you've probably noticed you've thought about a problem, you've got the next day and it's just kind of popped in there. That's all that sleep and it's working that stuff out. And statistically speaking, um, for those that say that you can survive on less than eight hours of sleep. Um, you're more likely being hit by lightning than you are to have the certain genes that are, you know, allowing you to stay up that those just those five hours. Okay, so key takeaways of this is um, ask away. It's better to be a bit annoying and get stuff right than it is to be stuck and do stuff wrong. It's better to ask those questions. Uh, find a mentor and learn to learn again, kind of go hand in hand. So find somebody that's going to help you uh, navigate sort of the path to your career and kind of show you the right ways to go. And learn to learn again is build up that network so that if there's new challenges come to you, you know where to get the information to solve them. Um, get out there. Uh, yeah, so you're here today at the NI Dev conference. It's good to go to and listen to people, but it's a lot better to go and interact with them. Go and ask them a question. Even if it's just, you know, oh, I find that bit of your talk interesting or whatever. It's that interaction that you get the real benefit from. And lastly, go to bed. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a strict parent, it's, it's really good for you. <laughs> um, and the last sort of thing is Baraka. So burnout's pretty bad, but the worst is the flu, especially if you're in the office. Because if one person gets it, everybody gets it. That's just the way it goes. And if you go into, if you go into our desks at work, uh, there isn't a desk that doesn't have Barack on it for that reason. <laughs> and yeah, just kind of like a PSA, if you're sick and you've got the flu, just stay at home, just work from home, just do that. Everybody will thank you for that. But that's everything for me. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for uh, bearing with me the technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I'm open for questions now, and if not now, I'll be around, so thanks. Oh, loads, yeah. Uh, one was to have more sleep. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, no, it, it is just generally good to get those eight hours of sleep. Like, a lot of people think that it's, you know, you have to stay up and learn, 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 especially when it comes to exams. Like, there's the kind of that ethos about cramming right before. It's actually not really that good. Stuff doesn't go in like that. It's, it's more about learning and letting your brain process that through the night. I asked how to get out of him quite a lot. That happened. Um, <laughs> you talk about a safe environment where you can ask questions people trust you, right? So, mm -hmm. so what, what do you think in, in terms of that? What was the most difficult or interesting question you asked? Hmm. Put me on the spot now. Um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. As as I was as I was developing an API, I asked what an API was, just as like a brain fart. I'm pretty sure that happened. Um, yeah, a couple of times uh, I asked if like if this was uh, Java or JavaScript, which 
It's kind of like a cardinal sin, right? That's pretty bad. Um, so that's probably like the couple of the worst ones I can think off the top of the head. But if someone tells you pose it, because really, what is an API? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can go all philosophical on it. Yeah. Really philosophical. Um, but there's definitely situations, you know, where you don't want to be wasting time and spinning your mm -hmm. wheels when you can ask a simple question. Um, I, I kind of was wondering, you know, if, if we're already in a situation and a newcomer comes in, uh, what behaviors or what should we do, you know, what sort of things do you think work when a newcomer um, Just having like a safe environment for them. So letting them know pretty early on. It's okay to ask silly questions. It's okay to fail. Like it's, there's not heavy pressures on what they're doing at the very start. Obviously you start to build up, you know, their responsibilities and how critical the stuff that they're working on is. But having, you know, that safe environment that you can fail a couple of times. And I think um, a point that I should have mentioned, uh, good bit of advice I got from one of the senior engineers was be stuck for 10 minutes so try stuff for 10 minutes and then come and ask for help and that was good because at least they're saying okay go and try it see how far you get and there's a couple of times he, he told me that and I went and tried it for 10 minutes and got it so it's 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 kind of making sure that you're not always going and asking for help it's you know trying to learn that stuff by yourself yeah also learn like the troubleshooting steps mm -hmm. um does anyone else have any other questions we have time for Yeah, so um, I've kind of, I haven't been doing it lately, which is, is bad on me, but um, I'm trying to develop games. So I did it at uni a bit, but I kind of, whenever I sold out and, you know, left the game biz behind uh, and got a real job, <laughs> um, I kind of didn't really use that. But I, I do have some projects that are sitting there and every so often I'll go back and start writing through stuff again. And it's quite good because mostly I work in, uh, work with JavaScript and stuff like that and Unity which I use for game development. Uh, I used to write everything in C Sharp, so it's good to have kind of a different, at least you're getting two different worlds immersed in. But yeah, like a good point to that is, uh, if you go to meetups and stuff, um, there's a good one, uh, which I think Art runs, and it's the Code Co-op. And some weeks they'll have a social where it's just a load of developers get together, chill out, talk about stuff. And some ones that they have is a co-op challenge and they'll get all these sort of challenges down from a website and you'll all sort of hunk around and start developing away, bashing away. And that's good too, because you can see how more senior people sort of atta like tackle things and how they break problems down. But that can get you into sort of new, new realms and teaching you new stuff.